I'm excited today to share with you two weeks worth of words, not just in one day. We'll take both weeks. And we're going to teach on generosity. And next week, we're going to share with you some things that uh, we are getting ready to launch in terms of our church. And, and I want to involve you in every step of it. So uh, today, we're going to teach on generosity. I don't want you to think of today's message being about money. I want you to think about today's message being about generosity, because every one of us needs to have a generous spirit. So we're going to look at the biblical truth of generosity. Today, we're going to look at four different areas of generosity, a heart of generosity, the atmosphere of generosity, uh, being generous to those who are in need, and then the reward of generosity. How many of you recognize we got a lot to pack in a short period of time? So let's get at it. I want to begin with a foundation of three areas that speak to generosity. And the first area is a way of seeing. To be generous, you have to have a way of seeing, of, of looking at things around you. Proverbs chapter 22 Verse 9 says, he who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. A generous eye sees beyond themselves and looks to give, up, to, give to others. They look for the need in other people. So to have a generous eye is to not be trained on yourself or what just concerns you, but a generous eye, a generous person is one who's looking for need and then wanting to fill it or fulfill it. Another thing that I think is important for us to recognize is that when it comes to generosity, it is not only having a generous eye, but it's a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking. Isaiah 32 verse 8 in the New Living Translation says this, but generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. Plan to do. In order to make plans, you've got to have thoughts concerning what's going on around you. Generous people plan. Generous people think. What can I do to be generous? So generosity thinks about the future and then makes plans to be generous into the future. Then uh, finally, in terms of laying the groundwork, generosity is living. It's a way of living. Same verse, Isaiah 32, verse 8, but this time in the New King James, and it says, but a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. The word stand there is a reference to how he lives. A generous person lives with the thought of generosity in and around him. He, he's a generous, he's a generous person. So g- generosity is not about your wallets. It's about your heart. Yes. We, we, we got that? Yeah. Generosity is about your heart. See, most will preach about giving to get when we really should be preaching We get to give. The difference is your heart. So generosity is about the heart. Giving really is about the heart. Deuteronomy chapter 15, beginning at verse 7, the Bible says, if anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns and land the Lord your God has given you, don't be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. If there's a need in your community, if there's a need in your town, don't be hard-hearted. Don't be hard-hearted. I have to confess. I seem like I do a lot of confession up here behind the platform. Um, but I have to confess. I, I get off of the freeway and drive up on an, uh, 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 an off-ramp, and there's a guy there holding a sign. Joyce immediately goes to digging in her church, her church, her purse, her bag, to find something to give. 
I immediately go into the thought process of, you're not getting anything from me. I, I don't know what's going on in your life, and I don't know what choices you've made, uh, but, you know, you're probably going to go from here and, and get in a car that's nicer than mine and drive home to it. You know, that's, that's where my head's at. She's digging for money. Now, a case can be made for both ways of thinking. It, it can. But <clears throat> what's God looking at? The heart. He's looking at not how much she's going to find in her bag to give. He's not necessarily looking at choices I make about whether I'm going to give or not give. He's looking at my heart. He's looking at her heart. How many of you know I lose out in that situation there with my heart? Don't, you want to be generous? Don't be hard-hearted. There's a lot of reasons why we get hard-hearted. There are. And we become crusty and and, and and the hardness of heart grips us because of things that we've seen and things we've experienced. And yet God says, don't be hard-hearted and don't be tight-fisted. Open up and give. Open up and give. Actually, verse 8 says this, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Don't be hard-hearted. Have the right kind of heart. Verse 9 says this, beware, be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. Don't be a person with wicked thoughts. And, and here's an example. The seventh year is the year for canceling debts in Jewish culture. Um, and it's near. So that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. What's this talking about? New King James says, beware of wicked thoughts in your heart. This is the second reference to our heart where generosity is concerned. And it goes on to give us an example of, of Israel's financial practice of eliminating all debt every seven years. Whatever debt was accrued during the course of seven years, the end of seven years, all of that debt was canceled. Now, how many of you would like to go back to that way of doing things? How come we don't go back to that? I'll tell you why. Because every one of, of you and, and me, here's what we do. We max out every credit card we could find for, for six years, 11 months, and 29, 30, 30 days. And then we get it all wiped out. The problem is, is that uh, we wouldn't be able to pay the minimum payments on that. So um, it's not necessarily a good idea for the kind of culture that we've created where money is concerned. It's like the guy who, who said, I'm amazing at, at managing uh, my credit cards. My bank just called and said my account was outstanding. I think he kind of got the wrong idea. So this guy here in verse 9, his wicked thoughts were, I'm going to lend this guy some money, and because of the seven-year release, I'll never get it paid back. Uh, and, and so notice in verse, so he's not going to lend him money. Notice in verse 9, he's, his lack of generosity is called wickedness and sinful. Wickedness and sinful. Verse 10. So give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, again, the third reference now to generosity and your heart, give uh, without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all of your work and in everything you put your hand to do. Whether you give or whether you don't give, God's blessing first and foremost is contingent on the condition of your heart in terms of how that uh, you actually give. Uh, a, a second area is that generosity creates an atmosphere. Listen, if all of us in this place 
in the three services we're going to have today here, if all of us had a generous heart, and out of that generous heart, we gave our resources, our time, uh, our, our gifts, our personalities, if we gave to the kingdom of God with a generous heart, it would create an atmosphere that people would not be able to, to, to back away from. They would walk into this place and something would grab hold of them, a, an atmosphere created by generosity. In Matthew 21, is, there's a story here that we tell on Palm Sunday about the triumphal entry of uh, Christ into Jerusalem. But it's interesting that the way the story begins is Jesus trying to find a, find a ride on, in, into Jerusalem, into the heart of the city. And it says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. And what he said is, go to the village that's ahead of you. We've got to get to Jerusalem. But you'll find a donkey tied there with a colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. So basically, what he was saying is, somebody has a donkey that I can ride and it, it, it belongs to somebody, bring it to me. Untie them and bring them to me. Now, how many of you know that Jesus is not into stealing? Is he? No, he's not into stealing. So um, obviously, they, they talked to, uh, one commentary says they negotiated with the owners of the donkey and the colt and asked to borrow them. Jesus said, untie them and bring them to me. Verse three, and if anyone says anything to you, here's the negotiation, here's the asking, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. In other words, you're gonna get them back, but I, the Lord needs them and they're gonna respond to that. Now, um, first of all, here, when it says the Lord needs them, um, that's outrageous to think that Jesus is in need and he asks man for help. I mean, that is outrageous. How many of you know that John chapter 5, verse 26, a scripture verse that we read recently, says that even as the Father is life in himself and is self existent, self-sufficient. So he has given to the son to have the same kind of life, same kind of self-existence in himself and, and to be self-existent. In other words, Jesus doesn't need a donkey. He doesn't need clothes, warm clothes. He doesn't need the encouragement of friends. He doesn't need a house to shelter him. He, he is self-existent. He doesn't need anything. And, and in particular here, he doesn't need a donkey for transportation. One of the redemptive names of the Lord is El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. Amen. The God who is more than enough. He doesn't need anything from us. And yet Matthew 21, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he had on his mind for the people, I, I, I've got to get there because something's going to happen when I get there in Jerusalem. And... Um, in order for me to get there, people are waiting for him. I've, I've, got, I've got to get a donkey. I'm going to read you a scripture verse that's going to show you why he, he had to get to Jerusalem. But the interesting thing is he got there to do what the father needed him to do, and he did it on the heels of generosity. Somebody gave their donkey to Jesus to ride into the city on. Somebody lent it to him. Somebody allowed him to borrow it. And here's, here's why Jesus needed to get there. Verse five says this, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. This actually fulfills a prophecy. This is in Zechariah, the Old Testament. Uh, these very words, and he's riding it on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He's fulfilling a prophecy here. So 
what is that, all, that prophecy all about? It's about the generosity of somebody to get Jesus to where he needed to be. Now watch what happens here. As Jesus came on the back of that donkey, verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred, was stirred. Something happened. A generosity of some farmer to get Jesus on the back of his donkey to get him into Jerusalem, that, that act of generosity changed the atmosphere of the whole city. The whole city was stirred. They were stirred. It took the catalyst of being generous, that catalyst of giving, to create an atmosphere of victory and triumph. The all-sufficient one chose, he chose to trust somebody to be generous towards him so that he could change the atmosphere of Jerusalem and do what he had been called to do there. Why is generosity necessary in our lives? You and I being generous of our time, our resources, our money, our talents creates a stirring. It creates an atmosphere for what God wants to do. Amen. You want to change an atmosphere? Be generous. You want to change the atmosphere? Be generous. Be generous. Now, I'm going to say something that I don't want to say too loud because I don't want the city to hear it. <laughs> but, um, well, sure. So, when we began to build this, I mean, we had a lot of opposition at the city government, city level, lots of opposition. And, um, you know, basically said, it's not going to happen. And, and we, we just kept pushing and kept moving and, and, and um, just lots and lots and lots of, of opposition. And, I mean, it, it, it delayed us for years, this opposition. We just kept moving, kept going, and, and we kept getting turned down, and we kept appealing. And, and eventually, at our last appeal, our last opportunity to appeal, um, we, we actually uh, got approval to have a church here. <clears throat> and it was a long, drawn-out battle. Um, so we moved in, and we began to, we had already started, but our church's generosity began to grow. Our influence as a result of generosity in our community began to be made known. And our generosity now is such that it has given us not only influence, but, I mean, it's, it's given us the ability to, to lead in some areas where our community is concerned. I mean, I, I right now am, am meeting w with pastors and um, I mean, this coming Wednesday, we're gonna meet with, I'm meeting on Monday uh, tomorrow for lunch with pastor of uh, the Baptist Church on the, the Big Baptist Church on the Boulevard and we're gonna have lunch and, and we're meeting with city officials and the fire chief and the, and the uh, 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 police chief, the, the sheriffs, and we're, we're, the, we're, we're rallying the pastors in our community to put together a crisis plan for the city. And in the event of an earthquake or, or whatever happens, it is a crisis. And, you know, the influence of the church, of the pastors, is, is causing uh, the city to come to us. And it reminds me of Isaiah 60 that says that arise and shine, church, for your light has come. Kings will come to your rising. And so um, you don't, don't get a bad attitude when things aren't going your way. Keep a good heart because eventually they will go your way. Be generous to those in need. Be generous to those in need. 
Deuteronomy chapter 15. Look at verses one and two. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. And this is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan they have made to a fellow Israelite. And they'll not require payment from anyone among their own people. We spoke of this because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. Verse 14, supply them liberally with your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this commandment today. What he's saying is you didn't have a roof and I gave you one. You didn't have a car, I gave you one. You didn't have health, I gave you health. God has been generous to us. Be generous to those who you see who are in need, who you think, and so therefore plan to be generous to them. It's how you live. It's how we live. Last thing today, and that is this. There's a reward for generosity. There's a reward for generosity. God does a lot of things that are generous towards you and I. But that's different than who he is. There's a difference between blessing and generosity. There's a difference between being blessed and being generous. Blessing is what God does. Generosity is who he is. God is love. God is light. God is truth, and God is reward. He blesses us, that's what he does, but who he is is reward. In Deuteronomy 28, verses one through eight, let me me read this. Now, it'll come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. The blessings will come upon you. They'll overtake you. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face. They'll come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses, in your bank accounts, and all to which you set your hand to do. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So these verses here speak of the blessing of God, but it's something God confers on us or gives to us or places on us. Blessing is what God does. Blessing is what you and I can do. Reward is different. Genesis chapter 15, verse one. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. God is speaking. I am your shield. I am your your exceeding great reward. I am reward. I am reward. I am your shield. Reward is not what I give you. Reward is who I am, says the Lord. I am reward. Again, God is love. God is reward. I give time, I give resources, 
I give money so I can get God. Just so happens in getting God, he possesses all of the things that we need or that we desire, but I'm not giving to get resources, more time. I'm giving to get God. And what I get with God is what he has, who he is. And I'm perfectly content with trusting him to dole out to me what I have need of based on what he knows, based on what he wants to do in my life. Hebrews chapter 11, verse six says this, without faith, it's impossible to please. Remember last week, God, grace, all of his riches as a result of what Jesus did on the cross. Everything that, that God has is in his hands and it's extended to you and I. Our faith, faith is man's. And our faith is, is our hands reaching up to God to receive from his grace. But we've got to exercise faith to receive his grace. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Amen. He is what? He is reward. He, because he is reward, he is a rewarder. Because he is love, he's a lover of man's soul. He's a lover of you and I. Because he is light, he gives light in dark situations. Because he is truth, he speaks truth in circumstances and situations that are filled with lies. And because he is reward, it's just naturally a truth that reward for us is going to come off of him towards us. He's a rewarder. But notice where the reward comes. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Who is him? Reward. Who diligently seek him. So as we begin this two-week series, I, I want your heart, we need your heart to be right. We need our hearts to be right. Right towards God right towards, towards the need that is around us, right towards people, right towards the money that we have, the gifts that we have, the resources we possess. We have, it all begins with the right heart, our heart of generosity. God's reward to us, being generous, is himself. Now, I don't know what can be better than that. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the opportunity we've been given to receive instruction from your word. We believe, Father, with all of our hearts that you are generous. It's who you are, and we want to be like you. We want to be generous with all that we have, all that we possess, all that we've been given. And so we check our hearts today. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for this group of people who've come with a heart of worship. And out of worship today, we, we stamped loud and clear that we trust you. We trust you with our lives. And we're seeking after you. We're hungry for more of you. Out of the word today, we receive instruction for the condition of our hearts. 
in giving whatever you've blessed us with. Thank you that our heart is pure, our motives are healthy and right. And we stand before you, Father, saying, whatever you have blessed us with, use it. Work it through us into a need that we see, into a need that we think about and plan for, into need, Lord, that we can help meet. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Before we go, close your eyes for just a moment. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, I want to pray with you. If you're at home watching online, you're here this morning, you don't know Christ Jesus as Savior and Lord, I'd love to introduce you to him. I believe the answer to your life and your life's spiritual need, physical need, emotional need, is a relationship with Jesus, the Son of God. God loves you so much, he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for you so that sin that separates us from God can be dealt with, covered by his shed blood. He desires a relationship with you. Will you say yes to him today? If you're here, if you're watching and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, today, today, will you say yes to the Lord? Acknowledge your need and let me pray with you. If you've never made Jesus Lord or you're away from God and you wanna come back home and you want me to pray with you, I want you right now, quickly, at home and in-house, lift your hand, hold it up high. Pastor, pray for me, I need Jesus. I wanna get right with God today. Who's here? Who's here? Anyone in this first service, I need Jesus. I need to get right with God. Today's my day. Anybody at all? How about at home? Raise your hand right where you're at. I need Christ, I need Jesus. Let's pray this prayer together, Lord Jesus. Thank you for loving me, forgiving me, being the Lord of my life. I believe that you are the Son of God. You died on the cross, rose again, and today come to live in my life as Lord and Savior. And from this day on, I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen.